is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Veronica Mars, Season 2, Episode 4, Green-Eyed Monster. In this episode, we get a lot of, uh, well, maybe you should have trusted your partner moments, and then a lot of, well, maybe you shouldn't trust your partner moments, and then a lot of, what the hell is going on with your partner moments, and I just, man, the show's making me really have some questions about my partner. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Many thanks to Anyas for commissioning this episode. It has, it's been quite a while since I watched the last one. So guys, Duncan's being an asshole, right? Is that just me? I'm just going to come right out of the gate and talk about this. Meg is in the hospital. She is in the hospital due to a bus crash that was, you know, I think premeditated because she was on the bus Because she refused to ride in the private car with Veronica and assuming Duncan as well, but really Veronica. And Duncan is visiting her on the sly at the hospital, which Veronica finds out because Meg was finally released from intensive care, but is still in a coma, evidently. And he is very defensive um veronica starts to say why didn't you tell me after meg's parents confront the two of them and veronica's saying why didn't you tell me and she's trying to say about their her parents because meg's parents directly blame duncan which is possibly the most irresponsible shit i have ever heard of in my life to blame another child like you know maybe what he's 18 so i guess but he's still a fucking like high school student and to put that on him that she's in this state because of you is is the cruelest most lazy and thoughtless thing and i don't think whatever happens that I will ever, ever be cool with Meg again because of the way that she treated Veronica and now seeing that she probably got that directly from her parents. That whole family seems to be garbage. Like, what the fuck? And I just, I feel like the writers are really reaching here as well with with the way that Meg was treating Veronica. It did not feel like it was in character. So to have her parents react this way feels like they're trying to rewrite history a little bit because we know what Meg was like last season and these people would not have raised that girl. So they're just kind of deciding that they're going to do whatever they feel like with Meg. And I guess we are just along for the ride. Um, I just, so I, the way that they handled this was super gross and like I said, irresponsible and cruel. But Veronica is like trying to talk to Duncan about it because they're clearly blaming him and they sort of like look at her, but they say something like the way they're saying it is like they're talking to him and they've been talking to him. And she, when she starts to say, why didn't you tell me? He interrupts and say that, I, that, um, that Meg is somebody I care about. And she stops and is like, I was going to say about her parents, but okay. And she comes by his hotel later and brings food. And they're joking around about whether or not they should bang or eat first. And she blurts out, "Why? how long have you been visiting Meg and why didn't you tell me about it? And Duncan gets a fucking attitude and drops his fork and is just like, 
do you want one egg roll or two? I guess we're doing Chinese food instead. And I swear to God, y'all, that is not going to fly with me. We cut right from there to them in bed. Like, they didn't have sex, apparently. He's asleep and she's awake on her computer. And I can't imagine getting into bed with somebody after they cop that sort of attitude with me. She's not accusing you of anything, Duncan. She wants to know why you didn't tell her, which is a fucking reasonable ass question. And the way that you're responding... If she hadn't been jealous in the first place and was just surprised, now it's going to turn into jealousy because now she's going to think some other shit is going on because you're handling this like a goddamn fool. Why keep it a secret? You don't think you're you don't think that the girl who's been blaming herself this whole time is going to show up to the hospital ever? You're just sitting there outside for God knows how much time, just sitting there all day. Apparently, her family's sick of the sight of you. You're going to run into her. She's going to find out. What the hell's wrong with you? I just, I don't understand his pushing her away on this and, and being like, I can't believe that you don't think she still matters to me. Why would she think that she still matters to you when you don't tell her anything? And when you keep on being like, well, you have to stop blaming yourself. This wasn't your fault about everything from the accident itself to just the way that her and Meg's friendship fell apart. You don't get to say that shit to her and then turn around and act like you're self-flagellating in the hallway outside and act like she has no place asking you about that. It's just, it's, that's completely unreasonable and, and rude, frankly, for you to like, you're supposed to be partners here and being partners means you talk about this kind of shit with each other in an honest way. And don't even try and tell me that if this were Logan and she was sitting outside that you wouldn't have a fucking opinion about that, dude. Like, get out of here. So I just needed to say fucking something about that because this show is treating and it, I don't know if this is just Veronica's personality, but like she's treating it like her mistake. Like, oh, I shouldn't have brought it up. Fucking yes, you should. Yeah, it's totally reasonable to bring this up. Anybody would ask about this. Like, why are we acting like she's being nosy? For once, she's not being overly nosy. She's asking a question she has a right to an answer for. And we're supposed to be like, oh, you've pushed it a little bit too far this time, Veronica. I don't know about this. He deserves his privacy. Why? Based on what? Like, uh, anyway, so that fucking irritated me. I just wanted to get that out of the way because, th like, there's a lot of, of shady relationship stuff happening in this episode. But that one was the one that I felt like was the most had the clearest answer because we know most sides of that situation. The only thing that I could imagine is that like, maybe he feels bad about it because he thinks that it's somehow connected to what's going on with his parents and his sister. And there's like an additional layer of guilt there. But, you know, regardless of that, he could fucking talk to Veronica about that. What uh, this was the this was the only one that I had a really strong opinion that I felt confident about. So I wanted to get that out of the way first. Um, so okay, <laughs> I said you guys all are are witnesses. I said in the last episode when we saw that fucking earring that I thought that looked like something a gangster would wear, and was I fucking right or what? Turns out it's Weevil's earring, man. I should have seen that coming. Um, I don't think I remember it, though. Like, I try and picture him wearing it, and I can kind of see it, but I feel like that's just imagination, not memory. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to crow about that for a little bit, because I love being right, even if it's on a tiny, insignificant thing. It seems like Weevil's being set up. And I don't even know... Like, I feel like Weevil being set up the way that he has been is directly connected to uh, Logan being also set up because I believe he was. 
I do not know how, though. It would be very tempting to say that Logan was setting up Weevil in retribution. But I don't think that Logan believes it was Weevil who set him up. I think he thinks it was somebody else. Um, we haven't really gotten a lot of time with Logan and he's in a very self-destructive spiral down right now. So I'm not going to ask. Okay. I'll go leave you alone, Logan, and allow you some time. But I, I don't think that this is between the two of them. And the guy that shows up that tries to like talk to Logan when he's first recovering consciousness feels like a factor here. I just don't know how exactly. Um, so, all right. Let's let's begin. Let's begin the the episode proper with the uh, the main issue that um, what do you call it? Client of the week. This is a woman who believes that her boyfriend, whom she thinks that she perhaps is going to marry, is cheating on her. And this chick. She is pretty well cast, actually. Um, she's the kind of person that you can really understand how somebody would come to like her and find her disarming and, you know, sort of ordinary, but in like an endearing way. But you can also see her shittiness. Right. It's like right under the surface there. It's the kind of thing where you get you can like just get the impression from her right away that her battling against her own shittiness is like a daily thing and that she doesn't win a lot of the time. Like you just get that sense. I really enjoyed this storyline, actually, because I definitely feel like this is how a lot of people feel. Which is that if you're going to be engaged to somebody, it's perfectly acceptable to lie about not having any money if you have money. Because you're supposed to be testing people to make sure that money doesn't matter to them. But if you pretend to have money and then it turns out you don't, that's entrapment, ladies and gentlemen. Because we take it for granted that money is going to be a draw and a factor when someone has it. <sighs> this bitch. I, it's such a shame because you watch this guy who clearly like cares about her. You know, Veronica throws herself at him in the privacy of a home where he could do whatever and nobody would see. I was at first thinking that she was just going to do this out on the goddamn street in front of her car. But thankfully she takes it inside. She finds a way. This scene where she's flirting with him outrageously and he is not responding is one of the most uncomfortable Veronica play acting scenes I think we've seen on this show so far. It is just so fucking like pathetic and uncomfortable. And like, it's just, you know, when it seems like somebody is, I don't want to say he's onto her because of course he isn't onto her. Like he knows what she's, doing here but he does seem to sense that she's full of shit somehow that's the part that i find like so difficult to watch is her having to keep up the charade even though he's like aware it's a charade in some fashion whether or not she's just pretending to be somebody that she's not in the way that many college girls do or pretending to be someone that she's not in a much more insidious way. Either way, he's not falling for it. And she has to keep on pushing it. And it's just like her sitting on the arm of the couch, like right near him and talking about how her and her uh, roommate or her, yeah, her dorm mate. Um, she like hints at the fact that they, she, the two of them have hooked up and it's just like, well, whatever, we're in college, right? Everyone experiments, like try to plant the idea in his head that maybe he could get a threesome with her and her roommate. It's just, oh, you guys. And this guy is tired. It's not even that he's like interested and tempted despite himself or that he's like, now, now, all right, you're very alluring in your weird way, but I'm too old for you or whatever. 
he's straight up just like, what is this, though? Hmm? What is this? What are you doing? This is, mm -mm. no, I don't think so. And I have to say, he gets my, like, undying respect for that. He must, when we find out, like, exactly how much money this dude has, maybe this is something that he deals with a lot. Maybe he has girls throwing at himself, at him in this fashion, and he thinks that she's somebody who, like, knows who he is and has tried to corner him and make it seem like it's an accident. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe I'm being too paranoid on his behalf now. But I just find it kind of fascinating. Right now, um, I'm reading for the book club this month, which we're going to be doing on Monday, by the way, if you want to come to that. Um, I'm reading Crazy Rich Asians. And there's a lot in there about the culture of people who are known for their money and how they have to be constantly on their guard because of it. And I just wonder if that's something that he has to deal with. And that's why he immediately reacts to her the way that he does with this kind of like disgust, barely disguised disgust is the way I want to frame it. But this dude, so he's like so incredibly loyal that this girl's not holding any appeal for him at all. He has gone to a, to get like training so that he can convert to Judaism for this woman, which is like a big fucking deal. Like he's taking classes. Wow. You know, like if I ever found out that Owen was doing something on this level for me, I don't think that I could ever recover from like the, the niceness wave. I think I'd drown. That's just so much effort and so much thoughtfulness. And, and the fact that he's doing all of this to surprise her and without her having, I think that's what it really is. Um, oh, Anya is saying the Facebook event for the book club says it's Tuesday, not Monday. Oh, that's right. We had to reschedule it. I'm sorry. Thank you, Anya. Yes, it is Tuesday, the 19th. Sorry. Um, but what was I saying? So she, Oh, okay. So the thing that I think is the sexiest about doing something like this isn't just the thoughtfulness of it, but also the fact that it ha it requires a lot of self-motivation. And women are used to doing all the labor in relationships, like most of it. And when a man decides that he's going to take on something like this, that extra labor, without being asked, without us really even expecting it, because, you know, I'm sure that she probably would have married him if he hadn't converted. I don't know. But it seemed like that was not a problem for her. Um, I think that that drive to do something that will benefit the relationship as a whole is rare enough that that on its own is like a huge factor, you know, so anyway, it's just a fucking shame because she's so paranoid that he's cheating on her that when it turns out the house he's staying in is not his, he's house sitting and that he maybe looked up her family and found out that she has money before he wanted to propose. This is all deal breakers to her. She thinks that he's only after her money initially and thinks that he pretended to have his own money to get her off her guard as well. Now, obviously, there's more to it than that, because if she did think that he just pretended to have money, so like to get her off her guard, because he knew that she also had it, that would have that would, you know, be that would point to him knowing from the start when they began dating that she had money, or he's pretending to have money just to impress her. Um, which under, I understand not being, I don't want to say not being impressed with somebody and lying to you about their money. I feel like that's absolutely true, but obviously it's more than not impressed. I'm just thinking about how I would react if a guy pretended that he had money. And I think it really all depends on the circumstances of it. If a guy pretended to have money when I was seeing him and it turned out he didn't, there is like one way in which that would be okay. Um, mostly it's the lying 
really. For me, dating somebody without money has never been a problem. I've dated plenty of dudes that did not have very much money. But the lying about it is really the thing. And it also points to this like assumption that I could continue lying to you until we were married and then you'd be stuck in this shit situation with me, which is just sort of like this weird entrapment that I'm like, what's that about? Um, and if a guy had lost all of his money via, you know, some investment that went really wrong, but that seemed like a good idea and really did seem like a good idea, or he lost it because fucking he went to school and it just drank up all of his funds or something. That's one thing versus somebody who just like, you know, has a gambling problem or committed real estate fraud. So I understand in principle, some of her feeling that she claims to be having about this. And I would even understand her just being like, he made it seem like he had money when he didn't. And that really does seem like a, like a lie that I don't know that I can get past. But when it turns into like, it's more than just the lie because I have also been lying to him in turn. That just, you don't have a leg to stand on there. You know, if she had been a very different person handling this from the beginning in a different way, she might have been able to get away with this line of thinking. But no, instead, it turns out that money was definitely a factor for her. She claims to love him, but it's clear that she doesn't really because it's very easy for her to dump him. And she dumps him on a voicemail as well, which is just really fucking immature and brutal and terrible. And think about what this poor guy is going to go through. He's like bought a ring. He's been going to classes. He's been doing all this stuff and he's going to get a voicemail from her. Ugh, that is horrifying. And, uh, you know, she doesn't get the information about the fact that this dude actually has money until several days later because Veronica mails her all of the stuff about it. So, If she had found out in that moment, if Veronica had told her, actually, he's got money. Um, But Veronica doesn't find out until after they hang up the phone and she's doing laundry and she sees the uh, handkerchief that he gave her has this emblem on it that she recognizes. And she recognizes it from a bottle, from a liquor bottle. Um, So apparently his family owns these distilleries, this company, and he's very wealthy. And so... In other words, this woman doesn't find out that he actually has it until her breaking up with him has really had time to sink in and there's no going back. If she had gotten that info on the phone with Veronica and backed up and went to his house immediately and was like, I am so sorry. I left this message for you. I felt like really betrayed, but I'm realizing that it shouldn't matter. She could still have gotten this shit back together. She could still have wound up with him and even made it seem like she had overcome a really shallow, ugly part of her personality because she cares about him so much. So I really like the fact that she doesn't get that chance. She gets the information that she wanted way after the damage has already been done. And, you know, after she has revealed who she really is in the long term, which, you know, that's the thing, man. I hate that. Like, there's so much about who we are that doesn't get determined until we're down to the wire and then it reveals we're really tested. And uh, it's such a shame that we can lie to ourselves so thoroughly about who we are because we are not put to the test that other people will believe us because of what we say. And they only have our say to go on. And then once we actually are tested, it turns out that we were like, we're not the person that we said. And it's not even that we were lying. It's that we didn't know either. Um, Which is, you know, I'm not giving her an excuse that she didn't know. But maybe she just didn't quite know. Maybe she really didn't. And all of a sudden she's being faced with that. I'd like to think she learned a little something about herself from this. Um, All right. So... I'm going to back up here and let's talk about what's going on with uh, Keith and Alicia. So obviously when they were down in that, uh, that club watching a jazz show, and then they went up to their room, 
they were recognized. And Keith, I think, knew in that moment that she was lying to him, but he was just kind of like, Welp, I'm going to let it go for now and hope that it really doesn't mean anything. Because I think Keith, as much as he is an investigator, I think he has learned more than Veronica has that sometimes you just don't want to know things and sometimes you don't need to know them. Sometimes knowing them does not help anything at all. And so he is much more willing to let shit go than Veronica would be in his place. Veronica's always like, well, what if it's this? What if it's that? What if she needs our help? And he's just kind of like, you're an adult woman and I trust you and you're going to handle this how you need to. And I'm just going to fucking stay out of it, which I respect a great deal. So he, I think, is aware she's completely lying to him when she says that uh, she does not know who that man was. But he lets it go. And then she confesses to him later that, in fact, she did know who who that man was. She says something about how Cher was his pet name for her, which I'm like, no, it wasn't. Like the instant she said that, I'm like, oh, you're only telling part of this truth. What are you doing? And um, it turns out, of course, we find out that she had her name changed. Like she's on the run from something. There's something going on here. And this dude and anybody who wants to help me out with his name, I don't remember. He is following her. He found her house and she wants Keith to give her a gun. And he says, I'm not giving you a gun with a seven year old in the house. Guys, have we seen Wallace's little brother before? Is that? I don't remember Wallace's little brother at all. At all. And I don't know if that's just because he hasn't really mattered directly to the story. But I feel like this child material is out of nowhere. Um, Anya says we've seen him in season one when there was gas in the house. Oh. I didn't remember that. Okay. Nathan Woods. Is that his name? The cop's name? FBI, whatever he is. Um, well, regardless, this kid, I don't remember, but Keith is, is worried about letting her have a gun that she doesn't know how to use in the house with this kid, which makes sense. This, this child is at the exact age where he's going to be like fucking around with that shit. Um, and he tells her that he'll stay with her and keep her safe. And it's really funny because then we get this scene where he's pretending that he was just in the neighborhood and that he just got some donuts and stopped by so that he could uh, say good morning. And it's perfectly obvious that he was there all night and ducked out to get donuts and came back. And poor fucking Wallace has to like act like he doesn't know what's going on here. He has to pretend and I guess it's for the benefit of the seven year old, although I don't think he would particularly give a shit. Um, but yeah, it's this, this whole song and dance. That's just like, Oh guys, why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to yourselves? Um, and it turns out to be a good thing because Keith is hanging out by the house when this dude tries to break in the window. And I don't know what exactly he's looking for, but I definitely get the impression that the show is trying to almost make it be like he's like, she took something that belongs to me. And what he means is his son. I don't feel like it makes sense for him to try and break into the house to get his son. So I don't think that's what it is. I think she took something else. I have no idea what that is though. Like she claims that he's an ex-boyfriend of hers. Who's crazy. But we, and we find out that he's a cop, but that, also, he had a record, right? So there's two things going on here. And I can't help but wonder if he's like somebody who was crooked, who like went straight and nobody ever knows that he was crooked in the first place. Or if there's like, I don't know. I'm just trying to think like if she's in witness protection and he was looking for her or if it really was just a relationship thing. And she like changed her name in order to get away from him. And that was just her person. Cause you can change your name. That's not an illegal thing to do. It takes a bunch of time, but you can do it. And I just, yeah, I'm really curious about what 
what her history with this dude is because he gives off a pretty solid vibe of being menacing. But I can't decide if that's just me being ready for him to be menacing because women are stalked by exes all the damn time and that's just how the world is. Or if it's genuinely what he's trying to project. Um, so yeah, I just, I don't know. I'm very, very curious about this and I feel like she doesn't seem like the kind of person that, um, you know, like is in witness protection or something like that because she has been fairly relaxed, but I don't know. You know, I will say though, that I could totally see her being like an ex criminal somehow. Um, because she seems to just have a really good head on her shoulders and I feel like if you get out of it and you are able to build a new life, you've got to be pretty smart. So, yeah, that I could see. If anybody's resourceful enough, I feel like it would be her. Um, but also, I feel like you don't want to start dating a private investigator if you have a secret past. So I don't know what she's thinking there, but maybe she's not. Maybe she was, maybe she's waiting for the other shoe to drop and knows that Keith is going to figure her out and is kind of wondering why it's taking this long. Because if I were her, I would have assumed that he'd figured it out by now. Um, because, guys, if you were me, or if you were him, rather, if you were Keith Mars and you uh, were about to get out into the dating world again, but you were also a private investigator with all the tools at your disposal to find out much of someone's history would you not take advantage of that before going out on your date i mean come on of course you would right come on i mean you can do that now people google each other and shit like so anyway um but this whole thing like he catches the dude he takes photos of him and the dude tries to, like, sort of threaten him, to which Keith is like, nope, I've got my gun on me. But this dude does not show him a gun in return. There's no sort of, like, face-off here. It just really comes down to, like, all right, fine, all right, I'll, I'll leave and I'll, I'll let you alone. But I feel like if he were here on official business, he'd be armed. You know, I feel like that's part of the uniform, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe not. Maybe this has nothing to, maybe this is purely a, um, a relationship thing and not at all like an actual, you know, criminal thing. Uh, and Anya says, I don't know. He was pretty outraged when Veronica did a background check on Felicia. Who was Felicia? Was Felicia? Oh, was that the woman who worked at his school, her school? Um, I forgot about that. Wallace's mom is Felicia. I've been calling her Alicia this whole time. Um. Oh, she's saying right? Question mark. Maybe, maybe I am right. No, I'm wrong. Okay. So it is Alicia. Um. I don't. Yeah. I, I mean, I just don't, I don't understand that mentality. If I were going to get dating again and after everything that went down with his ex, I would just, I would want to check up on people first. Um, but in any case, this, this dude go like winds up going up to Wallace at the end of this episode and introducing himself and just dropping this complete bomb that he's Wallace's dad which may or may not be true. You know, we don't know this dude. He maybe thinks that he's Wallace's dad and maybe he isn't. Or he knows he's not Wallace's dad and saying he is. Or he is Wallace's dad and he also is saying he is. Like, I don't know. But I don't trust it. I am going to trust Alicia over this dude. Um, And I just don't... I don't know how I feel about Wallace's long lost dad coming back into the picture as a plot device. Like I'm just very curious to see how they're going to handle this because I don't want there to be this big tawdry 
thing attached to his father. It would be kind of nice to just like deal with the emotional impact of this, but that's not the kind of show this is most of the time. So I don't know what's going to happen there. Um, Oh man. And plus besides all of this, Wallace is still seeing Jackie guys. I really do not like Jackie and I, I can't decide if it's the way she's written or the way in which Tessa Thompson delivers her lines. But I feel like some of the things that she's saying on the face of it wouldn't irritate me quite so much if she wasn't saying it the way that she does. Does that make sense? Like, I don't know. If she had had a different attitude when she says you didn't ask how high to Wallace, I feel like I would might might have been on her side because I have been saying that I don't like the way that Veronica takes advantage of Wallace and is always asking for stuff and doesn't really meet him halfway when he needs something that I've seen anyway. Um, so, you know, somebody pointing out the fact that she's kind of taking advantage of you is not in and of itself anything that I would have a problem with. I would agree. But the way she says it, she's so fucking snide about it and sulky in this way that like, considering how not, uh, how completely not monogamous you've been with Wallace, for you to act weirdly jealous of Veronica doesn't track. You don't get to be seeing other guys and he can't hang out with his friend, whom he is very like clearly only friends with because she has a boyfriend. So there's this tinge to her voice of like resentment that I just don't feel like she gets to have, you know, they haven't been together that long and you don't know anything about this situation and you just are you're new here, you know, so stop it. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't care for that. And I also just, you know, when she meets up with him at the lockers and she's like, back off ladies, he's mine. It's so like, again, is she, I, I guess that's her I was going to say, I guess that's the way that she announces she's monogamous with somebody. But no, I don't mean that she just stands outside their locker and yells that somebody is hers. I just mean, like, maybe that's confirmation to us as viewers that she's decided that he's going to be her only guy. I'm not clear on that. Neither, it appears, is Veronica. Because when Jackie says that, Veronica kind of side eyes her. And then later on when they're outside that dude's house and she's about to like try and seduce him, he, uh, she confronts him about seeing Jackie with some other guy. And he tries to be like, yeah, well, and how long ago was that? Like weeks ago before we ever even like, after we had had like two dates, which he says with cer a certain look on his face that implies to me that he feels like it's a bigger deal than that himself in his heart. And he just doesn't want to cop to it. And I understand that. I really do. But I can't decide whether he, whether he knew she was seeing other guys and he just doesn't like that Veronica's bringing it up because it means that other people know, and he doesn't want other people to know. Or if it means he did not know and her bringing this up is a, bit of a shock, but he's trying to play it off as best he can because he likes Jackie and wants to give her the benefit of the doubt. Or if he isn't sure himself what that means and doesn't really want to think about it. And so kind of wants her to drop it because he's just trying to like take things as they come and that's it. And he doesn't want to be faced with what this could mean. It could be any number of things. And I tend to think it's him giving her the benefit of the doubt that he suspected and that Veronica telling him confirmed some fears that he's had. But now that those fears have been confirmed, he's still trying to like 
wait before he passes judgment on the situation, which on the one hand I respect, and that's a grown up thing to do. On the other hand, it is very, it's, it reeks of a bit of denial as well. So we'll see what happens with Jackie, but I'm not really here for this bitch. And uh, the more I see of her, the less I like her, to be honest. But I would like to also acknowledge the fact that he says weeks ago when we'd only had like two dates. So time passing in this show is nothing that I can keep track of at all. Um, Two weeks, you know, since the like last episode. Okay. Noted. And that's fine. And I'm kind of glad that they actually gave me that marker. But if you'd asked me, I think I would have said like three days. You know, I would never have thought it was that that long a time. Um, all right. So dealt with Wallace. Who else we got? Who else we got? Oh, I talked about Duncan already. I'm super irritated about that. Um, oh, my God. The scene where that woman shows up and Veronica is uh has to like tackle her and she's got her curlers in and everything. Man, that is really something. Um Okay, so Oh, I should mention too. Keith notices that Veronica is staying at Duncan's hotel suite. Um which I kind of like the fact that he like confronts her about that because she really does seem to think that she's like pulling one over on him. Uh, Cause he's staying over at um, Alicia's. So she thinks that he won't notice she's gone because he's gone and he's not that stupid, you know, like he's keeping an eye on things the way that he do. And I don't, um, First of all, I want to mention how things are filmed in his hotel room. It is a really depressing room in a lot of ways. It's done in this, and I think this is purposeful, like this sort of noir style. Lots of shadow, lots of color. Like the lights are like green and red and stuff. It's a very stylized look. That does not work for a living space. That would be what you want it to look like in a bar. But as far as a hotel room, it's just sort of strange. Um, And I guess it's supposed to be in the noir style to imply like this is where she's being a bad girl, right? Like this is where she's breaking the rules by sneaking out of the house and she's having sex and she's like, you know, just kind of being, this is the seedier side of things. But it is kind of amusing to me that this is supposed to be one of the most expensive rooms in the entire hotel. And it just looks kind of creepy. Um, So she's there. And this is after the fight, like that I think is totally reasonable. And, um, he, he it, it turns out that Meg's sister is barging in. He like kind of directs Veronica to low key hide and she's not having it. And it, she has Meg's laptop and the she doesn't really have like a distinct claim here. Um, she just says, my parents got a call from the school. They're going, um, to clean out Meg's locker tomorrow. She kept this at school. It's got everything on it. Um, I'm sure Meg told you that my parents aren't real big on privacy. They go through our rooms, our cars, our backpacks. Um, and she says that somebody told her parents that she had this laptop, which they did not know about. And her parents are going to want to see what's on it, but she doesn't have the password. And I want to get her personal stuff off of this and, and says, but, and put it back by morning. I don't know why she wants to put it back unless it's just because she is assuming that Meg is going to work, wake up and notice it's not there. Um, But she says, all I know is if my parents see what's on there, they'll pull the plug on Meg tomorrow. What the fuck do they mean by that? Like. (laughs) 
Oh, oh, sorry, guys. I'm reading um, Anya's comments. I think she wanted to put back the computer, not the data. Gotcha. All right, got it. Um, she literally, like, and I really get the feeling this was literal, that her parents are going to want Meg dead if they find out whatever. Like, I don't feel like that was a joke. As much as it can be framed as a joke, wanting enough to get her, like, her files off, that's a, a sincere panic. Which makes me side-eye her sister a little bit and wonder if there's something going on with her, if she's involved in anything. What does she think is on there? How does she know that there's something on there? And they wind up getting together with, I think it's Hannah, the uh, hacker who gets in. And she, it's really amusing to me. They have this whole thing with like, so you want all the emails, right? Mac, thank you. I don't know why I thought Hannah. Weird. Maybe that's the actress's name. Um, it's weird, too, how she always plays a computer. Like, she was in True Blood recently, and I she plays, like, a similar... She's a vampire, but she's, like, does all the computer junk. And she played a computer girl in some other thing as well. I don't know why she always gets cast as that. Um, but, yeah, she is showing... She's like, so you want all the emails, right? This is the hard drive. And, like, drags and drops a folder that says email onto the drive, which is just, that's not how that works. It's not how any of this works, uh, but sure. Okay. And puts it onto an external thumb drive, which she gives to Duncan and Veronica decides that she cannot handle being around this shit and uh, decides to download it to her own laptop. I do not know what she's going to find. I really have no idea. <sighs> the, the, the idea that Meg, like, yeah, I got no, I got no theories guys. I really don't. Um, I just feel like whatever it was that happened, if Meg is at all involved, Whoever agreed to do, to like take her out, if that is what happened, if she was involved in some shit and it was too, too, got too hot and she had to be taken out, they decided to take down a whole fucking bus full of kids, which is nuts. Like, so that's what keeps making me want to stop and take a breath whenever I'm starting to be like, maybe this is so-and-so is that the, the scale of the crime is so huge that I don't want to assign that to anybody. Do you know what I mean? Um, I, <laughs> okay. I am just coming across a scene that I forgot about because I had talked already about, um, Alicia's husband, or I said her husband, Alicia's mysterious ex something. Um, and I forgot about the part where Keith comes out of the house and he finds his car booted. And there's not just one boot. There's a boot on every dang tire, which is such a fucking pain in the ass. And he calls up Lamb to, to find out what the fuck. Because when I saw that, I thought, that was Alicia's mysterious ex that did that. I didn't even put it together that Lamb did this because he was mad. And Lamb tells him, you send me in to arrest Carl Morgan, a.k.a. Nathan Woods, Chicago cop, big time decorated detective. Did you think I wouldn't check up on the guy, Keith? His record is one phone call away. What on earth? Why is he going by Nathan Woods? What's happening here? But it turns out that Lamb is just so m mad that he thinks that Keith tried to fuck him over that he got all these boots put on his car. That's shitty. It's an abuse of power. It's very petty, and I do not care for it. Um, so, yeah, that whole thing. I mean, between this, Keith dealing with Alicia's mess in general, also having to try and, like, 
manage all of his cases. We have a scene with him trying to like answer some questions that a client has calling him up and he doesn't even remember the dude's case and mistakenly tells him that his wife is cheating on him when it's not even about that. And then finally comes out and he's like, I know that you've been seeing your boyfriend at night. Uh, but he basically tells her like, butt out of it. But later on he comes back at her and it's just like, all right, maybe I need some help. And I'm like, you think, come on, buddy. Um, but yeah, that I, I wanted to mention the thing with lamb because it's, he gives an, a specific name. So the guy's name, allegedly his real name is Carl and his alias is Nathan Woods, but it could be the other way around. I'm not sure. Um, I'm wondering if maybe he was like a plant, like, did he get involved with her while she was doing crimes as like an undercover cop and they got romantically involved, but then she found out that he was with the five Oh and she had to bail and he's still tracking her down, even though he kind of loves her. And even though she had his child, I like the story that I'm weaving. All right. Last thing I want to talk about, obviously is what's going on with Weevil because I don't, this is confusing for me guys you're gonna have to help me out um he's wearing hoop earrings and combined with his bald head and goatee makes him look like a genie uh which i was very happy that veronica made fun of him for that because i definitely saw it immediately but she realizes that he used to wear this other earring that was in his yearbook picture and threatens to call the cops and tell them that she knows whose it is and he tells her, a few days before Curly beached, I got a strange call. Some guy was saying Curly was behind the bus crash. She says, you don't know who it was? And he said, they just said Curly was hired by the Fitzpatricks to get back at Servando. And she says, as in the fighting Fitzpatricks? And he says, uh-huh. And she says, my dad put five of the Fitzpatricks in Chino. And he says they're Irish Catholic. For every five you put away, there's ten more at home. And then he says, Servando has been bragging about how he hustled Leon Fitzpatrick out of a few grand down at River Styx. Who is Servando? Am I supposed to know who Servando is, guys? Because this is like... I rewound and rewatched this a few times and I can't Google anything, obviously, because spoilers. So I'm like rewinding and trying to, um, a pch -er who died in the crash. Why are we talking about him here? Like we know this. Have we, has his name been mentioned more than one time before? This feels really weirdly clumsy for this show. Usually they like set things up a little bit better, but they're just dropping this kid's name here. And I had no frame of reference at all. Like this was really legit confusing for me. And like I said, I've watched this episode twice now and I kept rewinding it just to be like, who is, who are they talking about? Like they say to get back at Servando, like it's, you know, he was mentioned in the episodes with all the journalists Huh. No memory of it. Oh, well. So apparently what, what this person's trying to say um, to him is that he got taken out by the Fitzpatricks and is obviously trying to instigate some kind of like war between the Fitzpatricks and whatever the name of the gang that uh, Weevil runs is. And when she asks him what he did in with this information, he's like, I didn't do anything because the Fitzpatrick's might be absolute trash, but even they are not going to kill a bus full of kids over three grand. And then says the problem would have been solved in an alley with a baseball bat. So, yeah, this is really, really, really weird. I don't think the Fitzpatrick's have anything to do with anything. I think obviously this person telling him whatever they need is just, you know, um, was a gangster with a big heart and smarts. The PCHers, I think, are just, that's the name of the gang is just PCHers. That doesn't have a ring to it. You need a better name there, Weevil. Um, yeah, it sounds, PCH sounds too much like a 
like a drug. Sounds like THC or PCP. It's too much, too like chemical sounding. Um, but yeah, so he says, I called him back. All it does is ring. She takes the number and when she traces it back, it says that it's, uh, it's a number on the property of the Eccles place, but it's not one that she is familiar with, she says. And she questions Logan about this. It's sort of a weird scene. Logan is so, he's so angry and I'm still like low key suspicious of him in all of this. I don't know exactly. I feel like Logan, I I don't want to be suspicious of him taking out a bus full of kids. I really fucking don't. But I could see Logan setting something up to be a prank and it going really terribly wrong and everybody dying like accidentally as a result of it and him being consumed by guilt because he didn't mean to do what he did and nobody knows and he's going to be able to walk away from it. But he has to like live with that. I just feel like Logan has something to do with this. I don't know. I don't know. I I hate thinking that because I like him despite himself, despite all of his garbage. I'm like rooting for him, but I feel like Logan's our guy, you guys. I don't know. But anyway, she goes up to him um, and I'm going to read you guys the exact wording that she says. Because I always feel like that's important. Saturday, September 24th, there was a two minute, 23 second phone call on Weevil's cell phone made from your house. The caller claimed that Curly Moran was responsible for the bus crash. The same Curly Moran who's friends with your dad. An expl- any explanation? And Logan genuinely seems to think that there's no connection at all. Like he really doesn't know what she's talking about. And I don't think that he's faking that. But he says, how do you know that he knows my dad? And what conspiracy theory have you pulled out of your ass this time? The fact evidenced by the poster in your house is that Curly Moran was the stunt coordinator on The Long Haul starring Aaron Eccles circa 1982. Now, September 24th, and he starts to get really defensive and says, like, I have any idea what, and then stops and is like, oh, shit, that's right. I threw a party. And it wasn't just rich kids who were there either. Even Weevil and his friends showed up. So it could have been one of Weevil's own guys. I don't know, you know, if it's G... I don't know how she's, like, traced this call. Um, If it was GPS that she used to figure out exactly where it was coming from. But I'm not, like... Let's see. There are five numbers registered to your house. This call came from a number I don't recognize. What does that mean? Does it mean that it's not one of the five numbers she's familiar with? Or that it's one of the five, but she's never seen it before? Or what? Like, I'm just, I'm a little unclear on exactly what she means here. Was it registered to his house or not? Is this outside of the registry or is it part of the registry and just not a number that she knows about? Like she thinks it's like for a specific office or something. Um, But yeah, I'm just a little bit confused about what that means because I assumed the first time when she said made from your house that my, my first instinct was to think it was a landline because of the time period. But then I was like, well, maybe it could be cell phone because maybe they were able to track GPS at that point. But I don't think that I think she'd have to get that information from the phone company. And I feel like that'd be a big pain. So it has to be on one of the five actually registered numbers and just a number that she does not personally know, which I don't, you know, why she's getting particular about that. If it's just the room that somebody was in and then trying to like piece together who was free to walk into that room and use that phone at that particular time, maybe that would work. Um, yeah, the whole thing is just sort of weird. The, the conversation and her animosity over it. Like I think she really does think he's trying to set Weevil up and, 
I'm a little bit bummed by the fact that she's like willing to go there because I, I want her to think better of Logan than I currently think of Logan. And the, she's thinking worse of him, to be honest, because I'm over here like maybe Logan accidentally killed a bus full of kids and that's really fucking horrible, but it would be an accident if it was, if my theory were correct. But what she's thinking is that Logan's trying to set up Weevil. That's a whole other, that's purposeful, malicious and, and wrong. And that's a totally other thing. And if she thinks he's capable of doing that, that's fucked up. So yikes. I don't know where Veronica's coming from anymore, guys. Um, so yeah, this episode like kind of had its ups and downs for me. There were parts of it that I just felt lost, like people that I felt like I was supposed to know or things that had been mentioned that they're all acting like I should. I don't know. It was just, but then there were parts of it that really I was like, oh, what does this mean? That's compelling. So I guess we'll have to wait and see what uh, next episode is. I hope that you guys enjoyed the coverage. Thank you guys all for coming. Thank you, Anya, again for commissioning this episode. Um, and yeah. I'm uh, finally caught up on a lot of my posting, so you'll be seeing all of these on time soon. I'm very excited about catching up finally. So thank you all again very much for commissioning, for listening, and I will see you again soon with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.